Let's now consider the natural history of disc injury. It's important to understand that the centre of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, is what is known as immune privilege, basically meaning the absence of immune functioning cells. The problem is, if the immune system does come in contact with the nucleus, as it can when the annulus is breached and the nucleus extrudes, the immune system will perceive the nucleus component of the disc as foreign and attack it. Now this is not necessarily as bad as it first sounds. It's more of a double-edged sword. One problem of the inflammatory response is that it acts as a nociceptive sensitizer leading to hyperalgesia, basically making local tissues, for example nerve roots, much more sensitive. This means mechanical pressure, which normally ought not be painful, is. In fact, Michael Joseph Smythe described this clearly in his paper, where he looped threads around the different nerve roots, stating, the nerve root which has been pressed upon by a disc was much more sensitive than a neighbouring nerve root not involved in the herniation. On the flip side, however, this inflammatory immune response leads to progressive resorption of the extruded nucleus by specialised cells called phagocytes. Here you can see the inward blebbing of a phagocyte in action. We can even measure a biomarker of this inflammatory process on a blood test using a chemical called interleukin-17. You can see subjects with ruptured discs have far higher levels of interleukin-17 than healthy controls. And this process, about two-thirds of the time, results in resorption of extruded disc fragment. Compare the disc prolapse here on an initial MRI with one 17 months later. And this is great news for patients and allows for positive messaging. If they have an extruded nucleus pulposus, it's more likely than not to spontaneously resolve. All it takes is time, often with a couple of steroid injections a few months apart to control their pain. Of course, this means that about one third of disc extrusions don't resorb with conservative management. And we know why. I assist a neurosurgeon, which means I often handle the surgically removed disc fragments. And it's quite common, especially in patients who have failed long periods of conservative management, to find pieces of vertebral end plate in the tissue, cartilage. It's quite obvious, they're firm rubbery pieces compared to the more friable consistency of the nucleus. And these cartilage fragments do not get resorbed by phagocytes. They're not immune privileged, as the nucleus is, and so are basically ignored by the immune system. This 2018 Japanese paper demonstrated as such. They found reduced immunity, specifically reduced phagocytic activity in disc fragments containing a lot of cartilage, explaining what they termed a failure of the expected spontaneous remission. So basically, the natural resolution or resorption of a disc extrusion depends on whether or not it's mainly nucleus pulposus or vertebral end plate cartilage. And while imperfect, we can sometimes get a sense of this on MRI. This paper suggests it's possible to identify cartilage within a disc prolapse, which may allow prediction of which patients are likely to respond best to conservative management. But what about patients who have a disc protrusion, which may be causing pain from either the annulus fibrosis or nerve root irritation, but where the nucleus is contained? Well, in this situation, natural resorption of the disc is not going to occur, at least not through phagocytosis. And this is probably the most common situation in so-called non-specific low back pain. Thankfully, there is an evidence-based approach. This paper from 1999 describes how a volunteer wore this belt with a pressure transducer at the end of a small rod. The pressure transducer was then inserted into the center of the L4-5 disc and held in place by the belt. Over a 24 hour period, the volunteer then engaged in a variety of different activities, during which the pressure in his L4-5 disc was continuously recorded. This graph shows the results. You can clearly see that lying down and reclined sitting lead to the lowest disc pressures, while sitting some forward, standing flexion and squatting were associated with very high disc pressures. Clearly, in terms of disc pressure, posture matters. Time of day also significantly influences disc pressure. 
The spinal discs are actually composed of more than 70% water, and about 25% of this can both exit or enter the disc over the course of a day and night. And this fluid shift leads to a change in disc pressure. Basically, discs contain proteoglycan molecules which attract water. Working against this is mechanical loading of a disc, which can force water out. And this load may be as simple as standing up with the axial loading from the weight of the body leading to a net movement of fluid out of the disc. The corollary of this is that in the recumbent position, with removal of axial loading, the proteoglycan molecules attract fluid leading to a net movement of fluid back into the disc. Indeed, this was shown in our belt wearing volunteer. Over seven hours of sleeping, simply due to the action of proteoglycans drawing fluid inwards, pressure in the disc increased 2.4 times. Putting these facts together, that disc pressures are increased both in the morning and with flexion-based postures, it makes sense that flexion activities should be avoided early in the morning. In fact, it's been shown that the disc stresses are three times greater for the same degree of lumbar flexion when performed in the morning than when performed in the evening. Three times higher. And this study used height as a surrogate marker for disc pressure, demonstrating that the most at-risk time was within the first one and a half to two hours of the morning. And this formed a key part of the treatment of our 43-year-old CrossFitter. In addition to reassurance and education regarding the likely course of his symptoms, he was told, if possible, to pop on a dressing gown for the first hour or so after rising, so that he didn't have to bend forwards while getting dressed. He was discouraged from going to the bathroom immediately and advised to eat breakfast standing up. And when he did get dressed, he was shown how to do this lying supine. By avoiding spinal flexion and axial loading at the same time, this reduced the peak pressures experienced by his injured discs. And understanding that reclined sitting has lower disc pressures than upright sitting, this was his recommended posture driving to work, also using a lumbar roll. And at work, he was encouraged to use a standing desk. And you can also see he's wearing slip-on shoes, shoes that can easily be put on with a long handle shoehorn. His low back was taped in this manner, providing him with enhanced proprioceptive feedback so he could more reliably avoid flexion. He was also taught different lifting techniques, both for heavier objects like children on the left or lighter objects on the right, more commonly known as the golfer's lift. And this allowed him to maintain his function while also allowing his back to recover. But these strategies weren't taught to him in a vacuum. You might recognise several of these strategies as similar to ideas from well-known back pain treatment protocols. This includes the maintenance of neutral spinal posture, common to both the McKenzie method and the approach popularised by Stuart McGill. His treatment also drew heavily on cognitive aspects to de-threaten his pain and encourage as much pain-free function as possible. And we paid a lot of attention when we were interpreting his MRI that we only focused on the specific findings that actually mattered. But at the end of the day, these strategies are based on science. And I believe the single most important paper informing the treatment of low back pain that has ever been published is this one. It was a randomised controlled trial where the intervention group was simply instructed to avoid flexion for the first two hours of the day. Sounding familiar? And those in the control group were prescribed six exercises. Patient education in the intervention centred around flexion avoidance, including how to log roll out of bed, instructions to avoid all bending, squatting and sitting for the first two hours after getting up. Subjects were given advice on how to carry out their usual activities. And after two hours, they were simply instructed to maintain a straight back. A very simple 45 minute intervention. So what results did they get? Well, compared to the pain reductions in the exercise group, the postural management group had almost six times the benefit at six months. And there was still clear evidence of benefit at 12 months, far in excess of what was achieved with the exercise-based approach. And yes, even after three years, compliant subjects still showed benefit, having 51% less pain days. All this with a single 45-minute educational intervention. Far superior results to any other intervention I've ever studied.
I'd like to now touch on something relevant to the concept of controlling spinal flexion in patients with back pain, something called the stress riser effect. During flexion, each involved joint contributes to the movement, and if for some reason a joint is blocked from moving, then adjacent joints will have to compensate by moving more, and this increased movement can increase the risk of injury. We see this for instance when the L5 vertebra is fused to the sacrum, preventing normal movement of the lower disc. Given the lower disc, the L5 S1 disc, normally contributes 75% of flexion of the lumbosacral spine, the overload on the L4 5 disc is obvious. A stress riser effect also exists following surgical fusion, and this is one reason some cynically refer to it as the gift that keeps on giving. Once a patient's had a fusion, it's likely that in the future it'll need to be extended to adjacent levels as they deteriorate, sometimes multiple times. And this makes it critical that if you've got a patient who's had a spinal fusion, they understand the importance of limiting lumbar flexion as this is their best chance of slowing down adjacent level degeneration. And here's a key point. The hip joint is also within this kinematic chain and restriction of hip flexion such as occurs with FAI, femoroacetabular impingement or hip arthritis can lead to a stress riser effect in the adjacent lumbosacral spine. There is, however, a simple strategy to reduce it. Given that the acetabular rim is deeper anteriorly than out laterally, performing hip flexion activities in a degree of relative abduction, abduction affords for a greater degree of hip flexion, reducing compensatory flexion in the lumbar spine. As an aside, the varying anatomy of different populations means that some people have more shallow hip sockets than others, affording better flexion. Genetically, it's thought that on average, Eastern Europeans have more shallow hip sockets, which allows them greater hip flexion. And this might be one reason they're good at weightlifting. Basically, they can go into a deep squat while sparing the spine. And for somebody with deep hip sockets, squatting can be modified, such as by utilizing a wider stance, the sumo squat, or lifting off blocks to make it safer. I'd like to quickly touch on something which is topical at the moment where I believe the science is at risk of being overinterpreted. We know that exercise is trophic to tissues. What does that mean? Well, when we progressively load a tissue, it adapts to resist the load. Basically, the tissue can get stronger. And discs exhibit this as well. This study, for instance, found that runners have increased disc height and better disc hydration than non-runners, a result of the increased disc loading. And this is also true for other means of loading a disc. Improvements in disc hydration have in fact been found in both cyclists and rowers. Some have suggested that this means cycling and rowing are therefore good for the back and should therefore not be discouraged in those with back pain. This perspective, however, in my opinion, is a misinterpretation of the science. It demonstrates that tissues, including discs, respond to load as would be predicted. It means that the discs of the rowers and cyclists studied became more resilient and better able to withstand the stresses placed on them. It does not mean though that those with back problems will benefit from these exercises. Indeed, the evidence would suggest the opposite. The lifetime prevalence of back pain in rowers is up to 94%, hardly something of a population with resilient discs. And a 2010 study on professional cyclists found that 58% had had low back pain in the previous 12 months. And obviously, these rates of low back pain are likely to be contributed to by the fact that these athletes are often training early in the morning when the pressures in their discs are highest. Rather, it makes sense that these exercises should only be encouraged either in someone without back pain or in someone in whom the exercise is not a problem. For example, patients with symptomatic spinal canal stenosis often find flexion-based exercises relieving. If someone has a disc injury, an annular tear, say, it's illogical to stress the tissue acutely. Further, if pain is caused secondary to a disc bulge irritating a nerve, flexion-based exercise will probably be provocative. Rather, I like to reassure my patients that while their back may not go back to exactly the way it was, there's no reason to not aim for a fully functional lifestyle, including intense exercise. And indeed, this is where our 43-year-old crossfitter ended up. He's now leading a full life, 
with no medications and no pain. And while he does engage in intense exercise regularly, he now does it just a bit differently. Thank you.